For the thousands in attendance and the millions watching around the world, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Nine months later. Colorado Springs police are investigating a video showing a cross burning near a mayoral campaign sign in Colorado Springs. A racial slur painted on Yemi Mobilati's campaign is now at the center of a bias motivated crime investigation tonight. Some of the video in this story might be difficult to watch. Carity on News Channel 13's Annabelle Childers is live at the intersection of North Union and Fillmore, where that's also made its way to the Rocky Mountain NAACP. This type of hate, this type of bigotry has to be rooted out, stamped out, and addressed, and that person should be held accountable because the next time it could be someone's life. David Duke was the supreme leader of the Ku Klux Klan, and he was planning a trip here to Colorado Springs, Colorado. The local Klan mission was to get 100 robed Klansmen to march in the streets. To get more members, they merged with other hate groups. Some of them were members of the military who had top-level security clearance. You may associate the Klan with the South, but the Klan had existed in Colorado for decades. In the 1920s, Klansmen included many state legislators and the governor. Even Stapleton Airport was named for a Klansman, Benjamin Stapleton, the mayor of Denver. Stallworth says the Klan never goes away, it just operates in the shadows. In the late 70s, the Klan reemerges in Colorado Springs with an ad in the newspaper looking for new members. Stallworth says the Klan viewed their upcoming march as similar to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s mission. April 24th, 2023. Family Flavors the Slide World Broadcasting Network reports on the sick act of terror against Mayor-elect Yemi Mabalad. This would signal the attack on independent news in Colorado Springs. The honey trap continues. It really does. We just happen to be the cast of 2023. They came and they terrorized us. They raided our homes. They raided our jobs. They took our belongings. They did all of these foul things under the guise of a federal hate crime. May 25th, I was, um, I was surrounded by unidentified officers. I was told that I needed to get out of my car. Um, I was asking to see a warrant before I got out of the car. However, the officers didn't allow me to see a warrant. They just yanked me out of my car, but not before reaching through the window and grabbing my phone from between my legs and touching my private parts. I'm barbecuing with some friends. Another task force comes saying they have arrest warrants for me. However, it's completely unrelated to this incident. A simple assault, they claim. I was a victim. I suffered broken bones. I suffered serious bodily injury.
August 28, 2022, Phoenix and Trinity are attacked by disgruntled Waffle House employees. Trinity is initially detained by police, but released without charge after police review video and confirms she was attacked first. With fears of additional violence from Waffle House workers, police release Trinity at the end of the parking lot. She is seen at the emergency room for severe injuries, including a broken wrist and facial contusions. Trinity contacted Waffle House corporate offices to speak about her injuries. Waffle House corporate would later fire three employees and offer Trinity an undisclosed cash settlement. Nine months later. Me, my family, my team, my comrades, my organization has been assaulted, not once, not twice, not thrice. But once again, trumped up charges have come. It's got ridiculous. It's getting to the point of discrimination. We get taken away from our families and we're humiliated and our families are feeling crazy because we were just taken. It, it was like, it was like a robbery. I've spent five days in the criminal justice center on a $25,000 bond for a simple assault. I'm being attacked simply for being a member of the media, for covering an event that happened. We covered this incident, and now we're being targeted, and I don't understand why. And nobody seems to want to take accountability. Text on my telephone. And I simply contacted him and asked him about people. We came back to celebrate my birthday. <laughs> sound of something very large being able to break the window. I didn't know what 
what's going on. It's so hard for me to know what to do. Someone in my situation, there's only one surefire place to go, and that's to your mother, and she's still here. So that's what I did. I went to my mother. PTSD. I have anxiety. I have depression. I have panic attacks. I have migraines from sensitivity to light. I can't even sleep. I can't eat. I can't be consistently happy. There are so many things that's going on with my mental health from the sheer terror when I have done absolutely nothing wrong. Me, I haven't done anything to anyone ever. <laughs> I'd rather be nice. That's just the type of person I am. <laughs> Three days later, July 6, 2023, I was abducted yet again by a team of CSPD task force personnel led by no other than Detective Dan Carter, who was recently named by myself and organization members for his role in the illegal search and seizure of family flavors to slide WBN's board members, belongings, and personal residence two months prior. After being surrounded and detained at gunpoint, I was notified that I had an arrest warrant for two counts of attempted murder on police officers that dated back to the year of 2020. But somehow the warrant had just come out in the first Monday of July of 2023. Nearly three and a half years later, conveniently after CSPD and the FBI were both indicated to have illegally violated the civil rights of multiple members of a nonprofit telecommunications and broadcasting organization. I'm in fear for and certain that my life is forfeit if this message is not circulated immediately simply because Dan Carter himself told me my black ass would pay for running my mouth. After being questioned by one of his colleagues and alleged department mistresses, Detective Black then notified me that she had called in a favor to have me held in CJC on a $1 million bond. These arrests come two hours before Phoenix is scheduled to appear at his preliminary hearing for the first set of bogus assault charges, where they were set to be dismissed. Phoenix would be forced to miss these proceedings due to this arrest for attempted murder on two police. This is a cold case over three years old that they intend to frame him for. Phoenix is given an unheard of $1 million bond by Judge McGuire. This was an act of retaliation by Judge McGuire because he was forced to dismiss fabricated charges Phoenix was being unlawfully prosecuted for just the previous year. Phoenix has his preliminary rescheduled, and seven days later, his first bogus charges are dismissed. The preliminary hearing for the new charges would be held seven days later. Judge Diana May, newly appointed judge and wife of Colorado policeman, be the overseeing judge for these proceedings. At the conclusion of this preliminary hearing, she states that although she feels probable cause was not completely proven and most of the evidence presented was circumstantial and unlikely to be admitted in a real trial, she would be ruling on the side of the prosecution. She goes on to say her ruling is based on Phoenix's criminal history, citing his convictions as a child from 2004 nearly 20 years before. Nine days later, she recuses herself, 
citing reasons of bias and prejudice under Colorado Code of Judicial Conduct Rule 2.11. August 5, 2023. The NAACP and Family Flavors the Slide hold a protest at the El Paso County Jail. No, this is Rashad Younger, press secretary with the Rocky Mountain NAACP. We're down here at the El Paso County Jail. We are checking in to uh, check on uh, Phoenix Ugrilla to see what his mental state is, as well as to give the opportunity for him to uh, pray with Pastor Bill. After hours of protest, a pastor was allowed inside to pray with Mr. Bernard. This would be the only relief he has provided for mental health and the only time he was afforded the freedom of religion. After the protest, he never received any mental health care nor access to practice his religion. Seven months later, Mr. Bernard is still being deprived of any type of mental health treatment and the freedom to practice his religion. August 18, 2023. An emergency status hearing is held to address several motions regarding Mr. Bernard's request to fire his second state-appointed attorney, Michael Staczynski, for not fulfilling his duties. Due to the recusal of Judge May, the 4th District appoints Judge Aaron Sokol to Mr. Bernard's case. Mr. Bernard's request for another bond hearing and preliminary are denied by Judge Sokol, even though it is on record that the previous judge, Diana May, had ruled under bias and prejudiced circumstances. After a series of court appearances throughout August and September, Judge Sokol announces every ADC attorney in the city has a conflict with Mr. Bernard, and she will be seeking someone from out of the county. October 3, 2023, Judge Sokol appoints Becky Briggs to Mr. Bernard's cases. She is a state-paid ADC attorney that was hired from Pueblo County. This day would be the one and only time Mr. Bernard meets with Miss Briggs. Two hours later. I, Derek Patrick Bernard Jr., inmate number A03273713. Hereby vocally relieve Rebecca Briggs, private attorney, from my case. You're officially fired. I no longer want you on my case. You've been relieved of your duties since October 4th, 5th, 6th, and every day beyond. Do not file any motions for me. I don't need your services. You need to immediately withdraw. Period. October 5th, 2023. So fast forward, I had court for a preliminary hearing yesterday. I arrived at the courthouse. Uh, as soon as I went through the metal detectors, I was surrounded by officers. They swarmed me. They put my hands behind my back, told me I was being detained, um, that they had a warrant for me, and they flashed a piece of paper in front of me. I started asking them, is this a search warrant or is this an arrest warrant, and what is this regarding? Um, they flashed a the piece of paper really fast again where I couldn't see it. And so I continued asking them, um, am I under arrest? Uh, they just told me at the time I was being detained uh, and they had a search warrant for my person. So they take me into a little room. It was about five by nine. There's six officers in there, some of them with masks that were covering their entire face, baseball caps. I couldn't see any part of them. Um, only one of them identified themselves to me at the time. This was... Uh, Officer Navarez, um, he identified himself as a member of the FBI Domestic Terrorism Task Force, um, which surprised me because I'm not a terrorist. Why are you stealing my things right now? Um, so I proceeded to ask him, what is this regarding? What are you looking for right now? Um, he wouldn't answer any of my questions. Uh, all the other officers began swarming in on me, telling me to be quiet, that I would be arrested for obstruction of justice. Uh, I told them I wasn't obstructing justice. I simply was asking what this warrant was for and asking what they were searching for. Nobody provided me with those answers at all. They took my phone. They had two guards escort me to my court date, which I was already late for. 
I mentioned several times to them throughout the process that I was supposed to be in court at 1.30 on division, in Division 9. They didn't answer me. Um, so I go to my court date, escorted by these two officers. Uh, I ask them the entire time I'm under arrest. I ask them to stop following me. They tell me they will not stop following me, that that is their job for the days to escort me. Uh, they wouldn't answer the questions when I asked them, was I under arrest? Uh, so they stand there, my entire court hearing, uh, and stay with me all the way until I leave the building. Um, I go to leave, I go to get into the car, and it's gone. I can't find it anywhere. I know I parked in a certain area. I see a parking attendant nearby. I asked him, did you guys have my car towed for some reason? Uh, he said he hasn't had any cars towed. He called his supervisor. Supervisor said they have had no car, no cars towed <sighs> to call the impound lot. I called the impound lot, but by this point it's 4.09. The impound lot closes at four o'clock. I call the card that I got from Mr. Navarez, the detective that identified himself as the FBI. His card says CSPD. I called him, I asked him, did they have my car towed? He said, yes, they had my car towed. I asked him, where's the warrant for my car being towed? He said they didn't have a warrant yet, but they were gonna apply for a warrant the next day. Uh, and they took it for administrative purposes. Um, I asked him, was that legal? He says, yes. They, they let me leave the courthouse at 4 p.m. with no phone, no car, no identification, no money. Trinity was never allowed to get her vehicle back from the impound because the title was inside of it and they would not allow her to access it. She was also never provided a warrant for the search and seizure of the vehicle. 30 days later, Trinity is notified she has a warrant out for her arrest. The charge? Intimidation of a judge. The warrant was applied for by none other than Nathan Jorsted, the corrupt CSPD officer from the first raid. The warrant alleges that Trinity retaliated against Judge Diana May during an elevator ride the two shared October 3rd, 2023. Trinity has maintained the claims of her innocence and admits to speaking with Judge May in her official capacity as a journalist. Diana May was asked for comment and two questions. She was never threatened, retaliated against, or disrespected in any way. Trinity turned herself into the El Paso County Jail and was released after paying a $10,000 bond. She awaits her trial. November 7, 2023. Phoenix, Trinity, Eshon, and Emini all have their upcoming court dates canceled. They are all rescheduled to December 1, 2023, at the same time, same place, and in front of a new undisclosed senior judge. This is Imani Wallace, the 29-year-old mother of Derek Bernard's 5-year-old son, Phoenix. Although the two have a complicated relationship, she is scheduled to be the defense's primary witness in Mr. Bernard's upcoming trial. She is also the older sister of A. Sean Matthews, also known as Buddha G. Buddha G was the first and primary suspect in the crime Mr. Bernard is being falsely accused of. Buddha G was charged with these crimes over eight months prior, in November of 2022. In the 14 months since his arraignment, he has had four preliminary hearings rescheduled and is set for a fifth one January 30, 2024. He has made reports to family and friends about being pressured by detectives to falsify testimony under oath and make statements about manufactured crimes he knows to be untrue. He claims detectives threatened him with persecution for crimes he is innocent of if he doesn't cooperate. He currently remains free on a bond of $10,000. November 16, 2023. Miss Wallace is arrested at her workplace for a series of manufactured crimes and taken to El Paso County Jail. She would see Judge McGuire the following day. She was issued a series of elevated and unconstitutional bonds by McGuire. 
She believes these were a retaliatory measure against her for her cooperation during the case he was forced to dismiss against Derek Bernard the previous year. Miss Wallace was arrested for five new charges, most of them manufactured high-level felonies. The 4th Judicial District Attorney's Office uses the severity of these charges to bully Miss Wallace against testifying on Mr. Bernard's behalf. They tell her she will never see her children again if she does not cooperate with their narratives in a Sean and Derek's cases. Her arrest leaves young Phoenix Bernard orphaned. Sick! I'll try to take my dad. With both of his parents being falsely imprisoned, his extremely ill grandmother must take him in with little resources of her own. Baby Phoenix would not be the only collateral damage from the police vendetta against his father. His sister Serenade and her mother are also terrorized by Dan Carter and Colorado Springs police. Police tell her she will be falsely charged with manufactured crimes if she continues to affiliate with Phoenix. She and Sarah Nade are forced into hiding as a result of the harassment and constant threats. December 1st, 2023, the mystery judge is revealed to be retired Judge Kim Karn, brought in from the 10th District, Pueblo County. Ignoring the repeated requests she remove herself from his case, Mr. Bernard's state-appointed attorney, Becky Briggs, instead requests the courts raise an issue with Mr. Bernard's competency. Judge Karn ignores Phoenix's request to fire Becky Briggs and instead halts his proceedings and orders a competency evaluation. On 12-8-2023, at approximately 4.15 p.m., I was approached by Officer Carter in Ward F3 of El Paso County Criminal Justice Center before I had a medical appointment. I stated I refused and would not be leaving the park for any reason at all before he walked away due to the events that took place the day before on 12-7-2023. Five minutes later, Officer Border of the El Paso County Sheriff's Office entered the ward personally and pointed me out in front of over 60 inmates, stating, Derek, you have to come with me or else things are going to get bad for you. The entire ward of F3 visibly saw multiple fully tact tactically dressed officers, masked and unmasked, standing outside of the ward door. Fearful for my life, I went into the hallway with Sheriff Border, Sheriff Border, where I was accosted yet again by Ethan Doherty and Nathan Jorstad, self-identified as FBI officers stated for the second day in a row that they had a federal warrant to obtain my DNA by force if I refused. There was an unidentified black female nurse from Wellpath Medical as well as a restraint team in the hallway close by that they told me would be mobilized to forcibly draw my lifeblood if I continued to refuse. Upon asking for a lawyer to be present, they told me they legally didn't have to adhere to any law to serve a federal search warrant and that I was obstructing justice by refusing to comply. With them surrounding me in the corner outside of Ward F3, I was forced to give my DNA to Ethan Doherty and Nathan George Dad, with the alternative being subjected to great bodily harm by large numbers of armed police and correctional officers within the jail. After taking my DNA against my will by way of intimidation, terrorism, and imminent threat of bodily harm or possible murder by needles, Ethan Doherty smiled at me stated that I made the right choice and would have been seriously fucked had I refused again because accidents happen all the time. January 2nd, 2024. Phoenix is given a competency evaluation by a newly licensed psychologist, Chris Ney, Aquino Vado. She conducts her evaluation over Webex and must report her findings to Judge Karn by January 22nd, 2024. To be continued.